the reason why I, I, I embarked on this research is because as at the time I was the MBA director and the executive MBA director in Trinity Business School in Ireland um, as part of Trinity College. And I was bombarded with questions from students, um, particularly from the executive MBA students who were asking questions like, what should I do? How do I manage my team? Thought to my, and so I thought, oh my goodness, they, we need all this. And so I started putting on these webinars and so many other programs did the same thing about how to manage in crisis. But it really got me thinking, oh my goodness, what have we done? Have I prepared my students um, for a situation like this? And I think the answer is no, absolutely. Was was anyone ready for this? No. And, and I think business schools um, and MBA programs in particular uh, need to really think about and reevaluate what it is that they're teaching and um, and is is really, you know, are, are some of the subjects that we teach or the amount of theory that we teach really necessary and really going to support our students in their professional careers. So in most MBA programs, you take a series of courses over two or three semesters. And it's much the same as when you were an undergraduate student, right? You, you take marketing on Monday and you take finance on Wednesdays. And then all of your exams are sort of jumbled up at the end. I was an MBA director. So MBA directorships, as anyone who's run an MBA knows, they take over your entire life. So when the pandemic hit, it was a huge wake-up call for me to question, what were we doing in the MBA? And so were we preparing our students um, for crises like this, for a world that is changing, VUCA, et cetera, et cetera. We talk about VUCA, but then we just go into classic theories, don't we? Um, and uh, use old cases and, and that kind of business. So I, I thought, you know, we're, we're definitely not. But then I thought to myself, well, surely other universities are. And I thought, what are other universities doing? Um, what are other MBA programs doing in order to address this um, in order to address this this topic, maybe it's just me. You know, maybe I've missed the boat, and everyone else has the answer, and I don't. So the question was was really looking around at other MBA programs and what are they doing. Um, and and I, I initially went into it as learning myself. I wanted to learn, and then I thought, well, you know, I could actually do a little bit of research on this, uh, putting my academic hat on. So I, I got a crew of other people together because I was super busy at the time, and we went out and we looked and we did an audit. So we we looked online to see what other programs were doing. So we got the um, list of MBA programs. So you know, 100 MBA programs was the sample, and we went to all of their websites and we documented what were their core mandatory curriculum. And it got messy sometimes because different programs are really special or unique. Um, but it was interesting nonetheless to see how all of these programs were configured. Um, and I realized that just like papers that were published 20 years ago in, in the academic literature on MBA education, they're, they're basically the same. So they're, they're siloed. There's very few integrative courses. And if there is an integrative course, it's a consulting project. So what we did is we wrote down what the course names were, and then we wrote down um, the little blurb. So we call them course descriptors. Generally, it's like a paragraph that states this is what the course is about. So we could get a bit more context. So we went through and we we looked at all of them and we read through all of the course descriptors. I think there was about 1600 of them is what we gathered. And um, and so we we were looking at this and at the same time we were reading the literature, um, going back and forth kind of abductively, I suppose, between the data and the literature. And there was there's one paper in particular by someone called Ferrero. Um, and Ferrero wrote about three different dimensions of, um, of grand challenges at the firm level of analysis. And so we thought, okay, so what, is this, what does this mean at the individual level of analysis? And so we theoretically percolated that down to the individual level. And then we looked to see, okay, where where is this within the within the curriculum? Where are these three areas within the curriculum across these MBA programs? So if I can remember those those three areas that we looked at, um, one of them was around multiple perspectives and and multiple stakeholders. It was basically like something kind of like lenses. So how many lenses do we give students to look at the world? And I think of theories as you know each theory is a different lens, right, to understand what's going on around us. And we can also think about, you know, stakeholders. So how many different stakeholders do we do we ask students to get into the shoes of? 
The next one was around like uncertainty and prediction and control. And so how much, um, how much are we looking to the future? And you had shared with me something that your dean um, asked you to do, which I find incredibly inspirational, which was, you know, in the you know, six months after the lockdown started, your dean said, start thinking about what's next. And that's exactly what we should all be doing. But so many of us at the time were thinking only about the now, the here and now. And so how do we get people to start thinking about the future and start thinking about what's possible as opposed to simply learning from the past? Now, I strongly believe that learning from the past, and I think most people would, learning from past case studies, great um, opportunity to, to gain insights. But a different skill is really thinking about the future whilst also acknowledging that we can't really control. One of the disciplines that appeared here that was really interesting to us was data analytics. So a lot of MBA programs now have uh, core courses in data analytics. And there's this sense that we found within this, within this program uh, or within the programs that data analytics will give you the answer. If you can just uh, understand data and how to analyze it, you'll be able to predict what's going to come next. And we all know that that's rubbish, right? We all know garbage in, garbage out. We all know that just because something happened before doesn't mean it's going to happen in the future. So there's this false sense of security that can, can be wound up or bound up within, within a business analytics course. Um, anyone who teaches organizational behavior or leadership would probably also agree that there are some students who just want the answer. And in a course like finance, you can give the answer. But in a course like leadership, it's it's always it depends on all sorts of different things and you need to be more critical and et cetera. Some students just don't like that because they want the answer. They're so uncomfortable living in uncertainty. And so, so I think data analytics and a lot of the courses and the rhetoric around it this sort of feeds into this need for certainty and this, this desire for control, which is a human need. We understand that in psychology, but it's, it's false, right? The world sometimes is unpredictable. The last uh, uh, feature or dimension is around sort of morality and ethics. Um, and I, I got into reading um, really, really interesting papers in particularly in the Journal of Business Ethics around this. And one, and I can't remember the author's names, but they were talking about how business research and business education um, tends to be quite positivist. And we tend to think of the world in, um, in right. It, it's actually in two different paths. They were like, it's either positivism, which is empiricism, which is um, you know, what we see is, is real. And then there's the other space, which is more relativism, which is, well, it all depends. But what's interesting about both is that, or neither, is that they do not make any moral claims. So in both philosophical camps, the way we tend to think about research and the way we tend to think about teaching is that we're not meant to make moral statements in the classroom or in our research. That's not our, our role or our position as academics. And so, and, and the question is, is, hang on a second, is it, and can we continue um, given the way the world is, not to lay bare who we are as people and what we believe in terms of right versus wrong, um, you know, opening up these really difficult debates. And I think that's what a lot of people struggle with um, is how do you go about having these sorts of debates? How do you go about um, making sure the environment is safe so that people uh, whether they're right wing or left wing, feel safe to have a conversation in the classroom. Um, so those are those those are the three kind of um, kind of buckets that we looked at, and we generally found that there's lots of examples, great examples of what MBA programs are doing around the world. But then there's a lot of areas where we could improve, where we could we could focus in a little bit more on on thinking about things a little bit a little bit more along these these lines. I suppose the the one of them is interdisciplinary thinking and and thinking through different different lenses. To me this is this is really important. I think this idea of you know shareholders come first, we we need to break this down and we need to start thinking about about different stakeholders in every single discipline. 
So that's that's one one thing that I think is is really quite crucial is having that kind of interdisciplinarity. Um, I think another uh, another issue or something else that's really important and and which resonates with students as well is having uh, a relation great relationships with the business community, and so bringing the business community into the classroom. Because I think academics, we are experts in pedagogy, we are experts in teaching, we are experts in theory, and we have so much to offer. But businesses and, and business leaders also have a lot to offer. And, um, and so for them to come in and, and just provide a different perspective is, is I think, really nice. So um, really developing good relationships with businesses and bringing them into the classroom all the time, not just once. And not just uh, and and not just one guest speaker. A third piece is well-being. So I think we we when we think about MBAs, MBA education, we think pressure, pressure, pressure. And um, a lot of students get burnt out. They have, don't have time to really think and reflect on what they're learning and their interactions with their peers. Um, staff as well will get burnt out, right? People working on the MBA. And so part of the benefits of the sprint um, is that you students focus in on one multidisciplinary topic at a time. And once they're done, then they move on to the next. So they don't have these multiple tracks that they need to focus in on. And it mirrors this agile way of working that organizations, as you know, uh, many modern organizations are using now where um you know where you've got that level of complexity but you also have these nice breaks and you know exactly what you're doing and you know your role and and so i think we can do things to support our students well-being through the design of our programs